My name is Jacob Sherman and today is November 6, 2009. Today I'm visiting with Dr. William Braun in his office here at on the campus of Oklahoma State University. This interview is being conducted by the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program, program as part of its O State Stories project. Uh, first off, I just want to congratulate you on, uh, you just uh, recently won a, a big award here. I was just wondering uh, what your thoughts about that award was and can you tell uh, the people uh, what that award was? It was an um, eminent faculty award. It's um, a, uh, an honor that's given mostly to researchers, mm -hmm. um, but basically they pick one person, one faculty member per year that, uh, that receives it. I, from what I've been told, it's the, the highest honor you can receive as a faculty member at OSU, and it's also accompanied by $10,000. Mm -hmm. And uh, is that $10,000 being used for research then? Or? Oh, no, they, that actually goes to the individual. Oh, nice. In my case, the majority of that's going to go to OU because uh, I'm still paying off cancer bills. So, oh, sorry. From the OU Medical Center. Sorry. So, uh, now, uh, now, can you describe for me like your background and where you grew up and uh -huh. how you got interested in uh, sure. agricultural work? Sure. Um, I was uh, uh, born in, in Minden, Nebraska on a farm and um, became interested in agriculture really at an early age. I grew up in um, Mexico and South America during the school year, but uh, each summer we flew back to the United States where I worked on the farm uh, in Nebraska. Now what kind of farm was it? Corn. Corn. Corn and cattle. Cattle. Now, uh, why were you, uh, why did you do your winters uh, in uh, Latin America? Uh, that's happened to be where my family was employed. Okay. So, as a kid you go where you Yeah, exactly. Now, uh, now, uh, what, now you uh, did your undergraduate work here at OSU? Yeah, bachelor's and master's were here at OSU. Uh, master's degree was uh, Robert Westerman, who uh, gave me a position as an hourly in his lab um, in 1981, and then he later gave me an assistantship. Uh, he took a, took a big chance on me, and uh, uh, yeah, it's like that award I received. It's everything about the people that helped you and very little about you as an individual um, because I've been helped a lot along the way. And had Dr. Westerman probably not employed me, I'd probably be waiting tables today. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what did he see in you? Don't know. You don't, but, know. Uh, don't know, but I'm forever indebted to, to him. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, as a Nebraskan, uh, why did you choose Oklahoma State? Uh, for, for, for a lot of different reasons. You know, you kind of want to get away from Nebraska, but um, I think they have a good school. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what was your impressions of campus uh, when you first got here? Well, OSU is a smaller school than the University of Nebraska, but uh, it's always been a pretty campus. Yeah, and they've always had that Georgian architecture that is quite, quite, quite pristine. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, now, did you have a? What was your major when you first came? It was an agronomy major. Agronomy. Yeah. Now, did you? Uh, I thought I read that you did uh, end up with turf studies. That's a that's a major. Oh, major. So you you get a degree, a bachelor's degree in agronomy, but you know there's all sorts of different majors with it. it's business ag, uh, um, wheat science, uh, in my case turf management. That's mm -hmm. just a major. But you take all the agronomy courses. Mm -hmm. And did you did you know right right offhand that you wanted to pursue uh, graduate studies or? 
No, you know, that's hard to say. You know, when you're a freshman or sophomore, there's very little that you know about what you're going to do, but very quickly uh, you find out. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what years did you attend uh, OSU? Um, here, I was from 75 to 79, mm -hmm. and then Masters 81 and 82. Now, were you involved with uh, any campus organizations at that time? Graduate school, no. There was there was just so much that you could could you know squeeze in, and you're pretty busy, so mm -hmm. there's no time for really anything other than your graduate studies. Uh, I was in a fraternity, but other than that, no. What was that experience for like for you? Which experience? The fraternity life. Uh. I certainly, it, I mean, it was fine. It's not something I would recommend to my kids. My my daughters probably want to be in a sorority, but my son, uh, yeah, probably a waste of time. Okay, that's curious. Now, uh, do you re do you have any other memories of that time that stand out for you, of your undergraduate experience? Well, I had an advisor who was superb. His name was Wayne Huffine, and he he was an absolutely absolute gem of a man. Uh, very well respected uh, throughout the country, and and uh, he was very committed to his students. Mm -hmm. He was a wonderful man. Mm -hmm. Now, were you involved with like any uh, organizations with the College of Ag Agriculture? Did you work at uh, the time here on campus? Did it work? Yeah, I had a little part-time job always oh, well, here and there. There were several. Mm -hmm. um, did you have any like favorite campus hangouts or anything like that? I mean, <laughs> the usual. There, there were you know Monday, Sunday through Thursday was always work and business. But then Friday night and Saturday night, I'm, I'm, I had my share of fun. I guess at the local watering holes. No, that's all right. Now, uh, now you spent four years. Did you graduate within four years? Yeah. And right away you went into graduate school here? No, not right away. I spent almost a year back at the farm mm -hmm. and then went to graduate school. Now, was there a, why did you make the choice? Was there any particular reason why you made the choice to come to graduate school? Um, yes, I mean, I, I wanted to work in nutrient management, which is what I do. And uh, yeah, it was just what I really liked the most. Yeah. Now, uh, what did you what did you focus on uh, when you came to graduate school? Was it nutrient management? Then? Yep. Yeah, I worked uh, with wheat. We were working on a nitrogen deficiency project in uh, wheat using selective vinyl electrodes for nitrate analysis. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what was your? Uh, did you have a tough transition into graduate school or were you just basically, how was that like? No, it was fun. I mean, graduate school was 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 uh, an eye-opener where you, you really got to see what you were made of. You, you had to study and work a lot harder than you had to before. Um, and it was all in all just an awesome experience. Mm -hmm. Grand, granted, it was more demanding, but really a great experience because it pushed you. Mm -hmm. Sort of like you were tossed in the fire, basically. Oh yeah, you worked. You worked with your fellow students. You got to know those guys. It was fun. Now, uh, did you have a assistantship at that time? I was hired as an hourly. An hourly in the, in the lab for Dr. Westerman, and then later got an assistantship. So, yeah, all the graduate students at the time actually were had assistantships. I was the only one that was an hourly. Is that how you got acquainted with Dr. Westerman? Yeah, he hired me in, in his lab. Did you know, did you have him as a professor as undergrad or? No. No? No. So, uh, you were in the soils lab then? Yep, just right down the hall, 055. It's a lab I'm in charge of today. <laughs> he moved up in the world. <laughs> so yeah, it was uh, from an hourly to, um, well, <coughs> thanks to Dr. Westerman because yeah, he took a huge chance on me, I think. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have. Yeah. Now, is he still a similar type of guy that he was back then? Same. He's assistant vice president of ag. 
nicest person you'll ever meet. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you did your PhD work at UNL. Yep. And uh, what was that in? It's also a PhD in agronomy. Agronomy? Yeah. I mean, it's soil science, but they give PhDs in agronomy in Nebraska. Mm -hmm. That is the title. Mm -hmm. Now, what, uh, similar uh, research? Yeah, nutrient management, nitrogen and phosphorus work. Okay. Now, uh, now, how did you come back to Oklahoma State then, after you got your PhD? From Nebraska, I went to Mexico with CIMIT. It's the International Amazing Weed Improvement Center that Dr. Borlaug, who you've probably heard of, mm -hmm. was the founder of. And I worked uh, in Mexico for two years. And then with CIMIT again, I was transferred to Guatemala and uh, was in Guatemala for another four years. But the position in Guatemala was as a regional agronomist, so I serviced nine countries in Central America and I was on the road, you know, virtually all the time. Covered Panama, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Honduras, El Salvador, uh, Guatemala, Cuba. Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Now, uh, what time period was this? That uh, was from 1985 to 1991. Now, did, did you see, for me as a historian, did you uh, Central America at this time was in the throes of upheaval in Nicaragua, El Salvador, Guatemala. Did you see any of that? Oh, yeah. And do you have any stories that you could possibly share with us? I was in San Miguel de Allende one day, that's in uh, the, the, the eastern parts of El Salvador, the way that sets, and uh, yeah, there, was, uh, there were battles, gun battles between the, uh, the, the FMLN and the El Salvador, the, the, the National Army, because, you know, there was such a political upheaval of people that, you know, were fighting against the government and they actually were being supported at that time by Cuba mm -hmm. uh, because they wanted communism in Central America. And so they succeeded for 10 years in Nicaragua, but then at the end of those 10 years, Daniel Ortega, uh, you know, gave in and the Contras, who the U.S. supported, basically were successful in getting rid of communism in Nicaragua. So El Salvador and Nicaragua were the reverse of each other. Mm -hmm. In El Salvador it was the, the Cubans that were supporting the, the mercenaries. And in Nicaragua it was the U.S. that was supporting the Contra. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, as an American, did you ever feel threatened? No. I mean, you had to be careful. You had to be, you know, you just had to be careful. But I didn't feel threatened. There was always a danger. People were being kidnapped. If you were wealthy, uh, yeah, the environment there was was dicey. Mm -hmm. Were you there at times when the nuns were murdered? There were in El Salvador. That was earlier, and those were Jesuit priests. Mm -hmm. um, the Jesuit. There were eight Jesuit priests that were basically assassinated, um, and that was eighty. That was earlier, that was okay. before okay. I was there. Before your time. Yeah. Now, uh, since you were... But I know where it was at. Mm -hmm. Drove by there many times. Yeah. That's kind of scary, wasn't it? Yeah, again, you just had to be careful. Uh, my work was de developing improved practices for the smallest of the farmer in El Salvador, mm -hmm. Guatemala, wherever it was. So you helped uh, subsistent farmers? Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Like yeah. people that Yeah, were... farmers that had maybe two acres of land mm -hmm. um, and, you know, were farming hillsides that were that steep, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you ever uh, go to Cuba then? Many times. Many times? Yeah, Cuba, Cuba's, Cuba's awful. I mean, working there was awful. Uh, I mean, it's changed a little bit now, but there was nothing painted. All the walls were gray. Very few ads. There was, you know, lots of pictures of Che Guevara and Fidel uh, that had some color in them. But, but working in Cuba was pathetic. Because what 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 uh, K 
Castro did was, the first thing he did is he went after the Catholic Church, and he had to wipe out the Catholic Church. And so the letters that Castro had with Che Guevara was that for communism to succeed, they said that they had to wipe out God from man. Uh, and so in doing so, then they go to the churches and they, they wouldn't destroy them. They left them, but they made sure that they were unkept, the vines growing over the doors and everything. Yeah. They made them look as sorry as possible. They made them look as if God was not present in their universe. Mm -hmm. And so they did get rid of God in Cuba. Mm -hmm. I mean, not everyone, but yeah. a lot. Yeah. Now, did, did Cuba ever collectivize their agriculture? Everything's government run, mm -hmm. so yes. Now, how did you feel? So, in a way, you. So, what did you do in Cuba? You helped villagers, or? No, in Cuba it was a little more. You worked with the national program, so you worked with their USDA guys mm -hmm. on practices that could possibly be adopted there. You did not have direct contact with the, the producers, but the producers were all. You know, it's all it's all state owned, so they're not really producers. Everybody's a worker. Because mm -hmm. nobody owns the land. Yep. The government owns the land. Did you ever feel conflicted by working for the Cubans? Conflicted? Yeah. Why would I feel conflicted? Just because uh, the way you saw things happening and the way their government controlled everything. That was my job. I was okay. there working in Cuba because it was part of my region. Uh, you know, their politics were their politics. Mm -hmm. I was not a politician. Okay. So you stayed clear out of that? Yeah. I... Alright, just curious. Now, uh, when did you come back to Oklahoma State then? I uh, came back in the latter parts of 91 as an assistant professor here. Mm -hmm. I was hired by OSU. Were you invited back or? Yeah, yes. I was asked to apply for a position here mm -hmm. and then uh, they offered it to me. Okay, and you accepted obviously. Yes sir. Now, what was, is it sort of prideful for you that uh, as an alum you came back and now are teaching here? How, does, how do you feel about being an alum and being also a faculty member at the same time? Uh, just a natural progression of things that you know you come back here you're gonna have to teach in some capacity mm -hmm. um, and I, I used to only have to teach one class every two years now I'm teaching or last year anyway before I got cancer I was teaching four classes a year mm -hmm. a lot of teaching because yeah. we lost faculty because economic woes and whatnot, but no, teaching is a good thing. Yeah. Now, do you do you like to teach than actually do research, or how do how do you feel overall? Well, I'm hired as a researcher. Um, I would prefer focusing on research. I've had a lot of graduate students, um, 55 now and counting. Mm -hmm that have received degrees with me. Yes, uh, I see your stacks here. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm more trained for research than teaching. But you got to teach. Mm -hmm. Especially the older, experienced people. That you need to put those guys in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Provided they're going to give the energy in the class that gets students motivated and excited. Yeah. If he's just going to go to class to blow smoke, then... No. Now, uh, are you full time through the College of Agriculture, or are you at yep, extension full, services, or full time through um, through uh, yes research, uh, Dr. Watson, and then I you know the teaching gets some support, but yeah, I'm through the research branch. Okay. Now, when you were hired in 1991, was that when you uh, took care of the Magruder pots? Yeah, if you've read that document, then whoever gets here, Dr. Westerman took care of those pots before me mm -hmm. from probably 1977 to 1991, and then 1991 on, and I've 
been in charge. Now, as a graduate student, did you ever do research over there? Oh yeah, yeah. A lot of the stuff that I collected from my work as a graduate student was off of the Magruder plots. Mm -hmm. Okay, now uh, we're going to go into uh, uh, questions about the Magruder plots. Yep. Okay. Now, first off, I, I want you to define agronomy for me. Okay. Agro agronomy is a compilation of the sciences that combine to, uh, to enable, improve production practices of virtually all crops uh, in uh, as sustainable a process as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, now the Magruder plots are part of the Oklahoma Agricultural Experiment Station, right? Yeah, in 1979 they were put into the National Registry of Historic Places mm -hmm. by Billy Tucker and Dr. Westerman. Mm -hmm. Now, how does the, the experiment station work within the university structure? Well, the experiment station is a part of the, those Hatch and Morrill Acts that were established in the 1850s. I'm not good on the history in terms of historians. So, so whether these other colleges like it or not, that this is a land-grant university, and we still receive land-grant funds uh, that they don't receive, mm -hmm. other colleges, mm -hmm. ag does. Yep. So this is still an ag school. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, now, uh, how does how does the experiment station fulfill the land grant mission? Um, land grant universities were established because. The, our country's forefathers recognized that agriculture needed to be the uh, bedrock on which all of these states, each and every one, would, would be able to uh, support the people in their state and then looking out into the future that possibly to export these things elsewhere. And so that land-grant mission of having an ag school in every state uh, as a result of that, the United States is the most powerful agricultural nation in the world. Mm -hmm. So, is it me? Is that land grant mission doing something? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Food security is one of them. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think the university is still fulfilling its land grant mission today? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, we wouldn't have the improved wheat varieties that we have out there today. We wouldn't have the green seeker production systems that we developed here at OSU that are now being used worldwide. We wouldn't have any of these products that are um, have been incredibly important for, for improving uh, crop production all over the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, can you uh, tell me your, uh, your acknowledgement knowledge of the Magruder Plots, like its background and its history? They were started in 1892, uh, where A.C. Magruder, in the picture that's up there, uh, implemented these plots. He was, uh, there were originally ten treatments that were included. Mm -hmm. We have six of those left. The six that are left are manure every four years, a check plot, a plot that receives phosphorus every year, a plot that receives nitrogen and phosphorus, a plot that receives nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and lime. So those are the ones that are left. The, it was basically at the time they wanted to, to know whether or not uh, the use of inorganic fertilizers would, would compete and compare to some of the manure plots that were there. They evaluated those 10 treatments, um, but oddly enough, A.C. Magruder was only here for three years because he was fired. Um, he was uh, accused of selling, I don't know, there was an animal or something that he took to, uh, to uh, um, I don't know, 
somehow, somewhere, he sold an animal he wasn't supposed to sell. He didn't have Regents' approval to do it, uh, and they fired him. He later went on to become a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. But those plots continued. Mm -hmm. And so those plots continue to be the oldest uh, continuous wheat trials uh, west of the Mississippi, and really the oldest, oldest continuous wheat trials in the United States. Mm -hmm. The oldest continuous wheat trials are in the world are at Rothamsted in England. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what about the Sanborn plots in Missouri? There's corn in there, they're, they're, but, but they don't have a continuous wheat plot. Okay. okay. So the Sanborn plots in Missouri are, are important, as are the moral plots at the University of Illinois. Mm -hmm. The Magruder plots over time, um, it's not like it's elegant research, but over time it's served as to us to be invaluable where we monitor organic carbon as a function of time uh, on the soil testing. Uh, we've been able to see how many years it has taken to exhaust the potassium supplies, how many years uh, it's taken to exhaust nitrogen supplies. We are still in the check plot that hasn't received any nutrients of any kind for you know 115 years still producing 20 bushel wheat. Mm -hmm. You said it, it decreased from 10 plots to six. Yes. Now what were the four that, what were the four? I don't remember what the four were that, that we got rid of or that they got rid of, but uh, the plots used to be right over here under stout. Mm -hmm. And so in 1947, they had to excavate them and take them out to where they're at today. And they took the surface 18 inches of that soil um, and uh, moved it, excavated it to um, the current location, which is at the experiment station just west of town. Now, uh, how, how are the nutrients applied? Are they applied uh, through mechanization? Or are they We apply them with mechanized uh, equipment. Mm -hmm. Put out broadcast and incorporated with a disc. Now, uh, when is that usually applied? The fertilizer is applied in the fall, in the just fall. right before planting. Right before planting? Yep. And these are winter wheats that are grown yeah, in? This is winter wheat. Um, we've changed the varieties as a function of time because it's required disease resistance, etc. But other than changing the varieties, nothing's been changed. Mm -hmm. Now, can you explain, like, can you define a, a variety for me? like? For the layman, can you explain what the varieties of wheat do? Yeah, over time, plant breeders have uh, have have been able to cross one wheat to another uh, via various different methods to produce better lines, lines that had disease resistance, lines that could possibly yield more, lines that had the dwarf gene built into them. Wheat used to be chest high. The wheats that we grow today are waist high, and the reason that we want the waist high weeds is because they won't fall over. Mm -hmm. So that has all been varieties, uh, work that's been done by plant breeders. Mm -hmm. Now, are these, uh, are these weeds that are currently being grown, are they, were the forebears the winter red wheat? Hard red winter wheat is what we grow in Oklahoma. There's soft white wheats that are grown uh, in Washington. There's spring wheats that are grown in Washington and, and the Yaqui Valley of Mexico. There's uh, hard white wheats that are grown in Virginia. Mm -hmm. Now, what 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 would you, what does this uh, wheat? What do you use this wheat for? Well, all of our wheat in in Oklahoma is either used for feed or for making bread. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what, how many, what's the output on the plots themselves? How many bushels per week can... The check plot is still, you know, it'll still produce 20 bushels per acre with no inputs. Granted, it changes by year. And then the NPK plot, depending on the year, we can produce up to 45 bushels per acre. Now, now is the 20 bushels per acre, was that standard back when the plots were... Oh yeah, yeah, in 1892, 20 bushel wheat would have been good wheat. Mm -hmm. Now, without fertilizer, is that still good wheat? 
Well, again, that's part of the experiment, and so we don't fertilize it. But is the wheat still good, the 20 bushels that we produce there? Sure. Is that a good number? No. No? No. The farmers, some farmers today are producing 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 bushel wheat mm -hmm. in Oklahoma. On, in a good year. Yeah. Okay. I was just... In an average year, 40, 40 bushels per acre. Now, uh, what kind of years have... Has it been good years lately? Or? Yes, in fact, uh, 2007, 2009 were, super, were, were great years. Um, and those years are characterized by, by timely rains at planting to get the weed up. Mm -hmm. uh, they can be followed by dry periods in the winter and then timely rains in the spring. Now, has there been bad years lately? or? Oh, yeah, we had... 2006, I think basically we got fried. It was an incredibly hot summer, and the wheat got fried. Uh, excuse me, not summer, but early spring, it was incredibly hot. So, no. yeah, it goes up and down. Yeah. Now, does frost or anything like that cold affect the wheat? Yes, it does. If we have an early frost in Oklahoma, um, you know, or, or excuse me, a late frost are the ones that are the killers. The early frosts are not because it's the winter wheat. Um, yes, mm -hmm. and we've had some. What about ice storms? Any death? We, have, we haven't had any ice storms. Okay. Now, what kind of knowledge has the Magruder plots, what kind of knowledge has that yielded that you've taken to farmers across the state? Well, the biggest one is that the prairie soils, when they were first tilled in 1890, they were about 4% organic matter. Today, they're 1% organic matter. So we take this virgin prairie soil and we till it, oxidize it with the equipment. You know, you turn it over, you're basically oxidizing it. Uh, we've taken organic matter down to 1% in those 115 years. Now, is there a certain percentage that will kill the sustainability of it? Not necessarily. I mean, we're at one percent. We can still produce wheat out there, but you would certainly like to get it up higher. You know, around two percent. But that's not what we're evaluating the trial. Mm -hmm. How would you add? So the basic of so you when you take the percentages down, you add the nutrients into the soil to basically regain that. Composition of yeah, ingrown, pretty much. Yeah. We apply fixed amounts to the exact same treatment year after year, mm -hmm. and so that brings it back up to a, what it would normally be. Uh, no, no. But once you lose that soil organic matter, you've lost it. Does that replenish some? Yes. Okay. But probably not all. Now, uh, what kind of nutrients are you? added to it. We apply nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and then the last plot line. And then there's one plot where they get manure every four years. Mm -hmm. Every four years? Yeah. Not every year? No. Not every year would over uh, nutrize it? Or? No, it's just what was set up by people that established the Magruder plots and then later continued. Mm -hmm. Was that they get the same rate as these other treatments in terms of N, P, and K, mm -hmm. but every four years. Okay. Because the nitrogen and manure has to mineralize, it has to break down. Yeah. Okay. Now, have you had, uh, you've worked since 1991 out there. How many students have you worked with uh, developing, uh, using the Magruder plots for their field work? All of our students, to a certain extent, have to work out there at some point in time because it's not that they're necessarily a part of their thesis. But they're involved. And so, yeah, I've had 55, and all 55 have been exposed to what's going on at the Magruder plots. They've all had to work out there in one way, shape, or form or another. Do you remember any particular students that you worked with? All of them. All of them? You want me to rattle off? Their no, 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 not all of them. But have any, have some gone and do PhD work? Some good. Oh, yeah, we have. Um, of the 19 PhD students, there's 13 that, uh, there's one at the assistant professor at Ohio State, another assistant professor at Virginia Tech, uh, another assistant professor at Louisiana State, uh, another one at uh, Montana State, mm -hmm. uh, another assistant professor at Kansas State, 
You know, we've got a bunch of our students scattered all over the U.S. and the world. Has any uh, come back to Oklahoma State? Yeah, Dr. Arnell got his degree here with me, and he's now an assistant professor. Mm -hmm. So, how do, how do you feel about that? Does that give you a sense of pride or no? Do I just want him gainfully employed and good <laughs> jobs, you know, no matter where that is. Okay. Now, uh, how does uh, Magruder Plots compare with other uh, wheat research out there? Because I know Montana State and Minnesota has plots. They're, they're very simplistic. I mean, there's, there's nothing, there's no rocket science in those Magruder Plots. Uh, but they're still useful in terms of benchmark values, soil test values, uh, all that kind of stuff that, that, that we still can use. But, but it's not sophisticated. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, ha have you had any mishaps along the way and with the research over there? Like, if we made a mistake? Yeah. Not that I know of. Dr. Westerman always used to say that, you know, there's 11 commandments, and the 11th was, you better not screw up the migrator plot. So. <laughs> now, us. Uh, so we have it. That's good. And under your watch, you haven't? To my knowledge. To your knowledge. <laughs> there could be students that did some strange things out there, but to my knowledge. We have had where they applied urea to a check plot out of 222, which is caddy corn to the Magruder plots. Mm -hmm. And I had them go out there and vacuum it all up. Oh, wow. Now, so those are long term plots, you know. No, is there a... They were like, well, can we just do something else? You know, get out there real vacuum. <laughs> they lay down the lot. Now, is there any, like, institutional safeguards out there? Like what? Because I come from, before I came to Oklahoma State, I was at the University of Illinois. And you could, if you mess around in the moral plots, they could expel you from school. No, none to my knowledge. But the, the these are more excluded secluded than the moral plots at Illinois. Mm -hmm. You mean those are right next to the library? Yeah. Yeah, no. Oh. Now, now, uh, were you also, uh, did you help get the, the, the barn out there under the National Historic Registry? I had nothing to do with that. Yeah, nothing to do with that. Now, uh, where do you see the Magruder plots heading into the future? Um, I'll put it this way, I've been asked many times, you know, should we go no tillage and into a rotation that would be more relevant to uh, producers today. And, uh, you know, there's 115 years there, I don't want to be the guy that screwed up the cycle, you know, so it's like, why am I going to mess with the Magruder plots, when if that's what I want to do, I want to do a rotation study, ah, find some other land. Mm -hmm. Those have been continuous wheat. And whether or not that's a good or a bad thing, I'm not going to say. But I'm not going to mess them up. Mm -hmm. So, well, this is stupid. We're producing continuous wheat. Maybe. Yeah. Now, uh, what are the big issues that you see are that agriculture and wheat farming faces in the future as well? Well, uh, I work with Dr. Stone, um, and we just have to do a better job of, of uh, producing more with less and producing more on the same uh, acre of land. And that's why he and I are working on some really fun technologies right now, just on seed orientation, where we think we can squeeze in more plants uh, per acre by manipulating their orientation as they emerge. And we're going to line them up. Uh, like uh, little Chinese toy soldiers, you know, just right in a row with their leaves perfectly spread out left and right, just in a row. And we've uh, uncovered a method that we're going to do that. So Randy Taylor, John Soley, we're working on that. We're going to have a, we'll have a new planter. Mm -hmm. What about, uh, is there any issues pertaining like sus sustainability? Regretted well, plots are not a good example of sustainability because we, it's conventionally tilled, we don't use no tillage, we're just adhering to you know, what the, our forefathers set up before us. Uh, are the Magruder plots sustainable? Well, a lot of people say, yeah, look at the check pot, it still produces 20 bushels per acre. Mm -hmm. 
So, to a certain extent, maybe they are. Maybe conventional till wheat is sustainable because. Yeah. But other people would say no. Conventional till is not a good thing. Okay. Now, is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, the, the Magruder plots have been, although simplistic, have been a valuable benchmark for us to, to rely on. Mm -hmm. That they provided us with benchmark data that, that we don't get in other plots. And even though they're non-replicated, uh, they can't be statistically analyzed, they, uh, they still provide a benchmark. Why is that? In 115 years, you know, who needs reps? Yeah. I don't need to replicate it, hell. It's been replicated 115 years. So. Yeah. so, I just want to thank you for your time here today for granting me this interview. You're so, welcome. Yeah. It's 117 years, actually. 117. Yeah. Well, it's getting up there. Yeah, yeah. it's getting up there. So, thank All you right. for your time. So. You're welcome.